Hi, good morning uh, or good afternoon to who is joining from China. My name is Alessio Petino. I'm the Knowledge Coordinator of the USME Center in Beijing. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here today and to host this uh, USME Center webinar that uh, co-organized with the China Italy Chamber of Commerce in China. So today's topic, uh, today we're going to introduce one report that together with the CICC, the Italian Chamber, we have uh, completed recently about industrial robots. And um, industrial robots is, uh, is a very important sector in China. Since 2013, China has been the world largest market for industrial robots, and it will continue to be so uh, for the next years, given the strong, given the fact that it's, it's uh, a priority sector of, of the uh, of the Chinese government. Um, so today I'm trying to switch slides. Uh, yes, today today's a uh, very short webinar. We are going to have uh, the one of the authors of, of this report introducing going through the report and and introducing the key content and the main highlights. And then there will there, will, there is going to be a Q and A session at the end during which uh, you can ask all the questions uh, that you have. Uh, before before starting, I would like to spend a couple of minutes about on the USME Center. Um, USME Center is a project funded by the EU uh, since 2010, and our mission is to provide support to European and small and medium-sized enterprises to come to China, to export to China, um, and to do business with China. We are in a third phase, uh, which will run until next year in March. And we are implemented by a consortium of five chambers of commerce and business organizations, uh, which you can find on the bottom. And we are led, um, we are coordinated by the, the Italian chamber. Uh, we are, we partner with a lot of organizations, uh, government, business, um, including the Enterprise Europe Network. And we have a physical office in Beijing, which is where we are uh, now. Um, very, sh uh, very short, very briefly, we provide four main types of services. Uh, the first one is the knowledge center. Basically, we write reports, uh, guidelines like the one we are going to introduce today. We also have an advice center, which basically is a sort of help desk uh, where people can, companies can reach out to us with any questions uh, on, on any aspects of doing business with China. And we have a team of experts ready to answer these questions for free. We have a training center, like we organize training sessions, workshops on different aspects. Um, and last, we have an advocacy platform through which we try to promote uh, information about uh, new draft uh, regulations or, and so on. Um, very quick overview about, uh, we, we are doing a lot of, we're very active recently. We have a lot of um, activities planned for this for this month, um, including the food and beverage sector, also in uh, uh, about uh, managing businesses in in in, in a remote from from remote positions. Uh, we are, we are going also to have two other launch events for two other reports that we have recently completed in the healthcare sector and and also one for health for pet food. Um, we also have um, a database of frequently asked questions and a self-diagnosis tool, which I would like to sh show you very quickly here how it works. Um, it's basically, it's basically um, a tool that helps you uh, assess uh, what is your knowledge of China, of course. Um, it's based on different quizzes. Here you filter some information general information for statistical purposes, and then you have different questions with different answers. And then uh, you, you select um, the most appropriate questions. And then based on the questions you have selected, you get a score and some analysis and assessment report. And then for each of the, uh, of the questions, there is an answer, a detailed answer of why one question was wrong or right. And then there are links to uh, FAQs or uh, recordings of webinars we have in this area. Um, it's completely free. It's available on the website. So if you don't, uh, you are very welcome to take a look. Um, now, now before before uh, um, introducing the, the author of the report, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Giulia Gallarati, who is the Secretary, Secretary General, General of, of the, the Italian Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Commerce. Giulia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alessio, and good morning to the ones who are connected in uh, Europe, and uh, good afternoon who is connected from uh, uh, China. Um, so this is Giulia Gallarati, I'm the Secretary General of China Italy Chamber of Commerce and I'm the, the Chair of the Board of the USME Center. Um, yes, thank you. 
So China Italy Chamber of Commerce is uh, um, the only business organization that is both recognized by the Italian government and the um, from the Ministry of Economic Development and the uh, Ministry of Civil Affairs in China. And the main aim is to boost the internationalization and the settlement of Italian business and to promote the made in Italy in, the, um, in China. Uh, so this year we celebrate 30 years from the refoundation of the, the chamber and uh, we are cur we currently have five offices in China, uh, Beijing, Chongqing, uh, Guangzhou, Shanghai and Suzhou. And now we have also two new tasks in uh, uh, Chengdu and in Shenzhen. Um, the member base is composed by more than 600 Italian companies already based in China, and they are both public invested or multinational corporation, but also small and medium sized enterprises. Next, please. Uh, so basically our mission is to enhance the economic growth and it's member by focusing on education, promotion, development and of the business uh, uh, community. Next. So the backbone of the um, CICC, uh, our working group. Um, so in order to have top, uh, top, uh, sorry, bottom up um, input from the uh, companies, and that will help us to properly plan our activities, we listen to our working groups that now are more than thirteen, and they basically help the companies to aggregate in terms of uh, uh, topic or in terms of sectors, industries. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they mainly uh, share information, resources and ideas, uh, but they also, um, they also organize activities. They build, the most important thing is that they build sectorial expertise within the uh, CICC. That will be benefited by uh, both uh, members, but also who is interested in uh, joining our activities next. Um, the main services or activities organized by the chambers are informative services, events and communication and promotion service, business contact and activities such as the B2B or institutional and business mission and the, uh, the participation of exhibition in both uh, China and in Italy. And then we also organize specific support or consultancy services upon uh, request. So if you are interested in uh, knowing more about the chamber, I leave here our contacts of all our offices. And uh, now I uh, get back the um, floor to, um, to Alessio for the, um, uh, for the event. I wish you good luck. Uh, and uh, this is one of the best, uh, in my opinion, the best uh, report that the USME Center together the CICC developed. So um, um, I, I wish you the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Julia, for, for this introduction about CACC. And indeed, uh, we are very happy with this report. We think it's very comprehensive and very detailed. It really provides, it really covers all aspects from, from, from market aspects, including play, key players, regional clusters, but also the um, government incentives, uh, the, the main policies driving the sector, but also the market uh, access requirements, especially in terms of standards, but also certification. Uh, and then there are also some case studies at the end. Um, and we are very happy to have uh, Melanie, Miss Melanie Lee, uh, who is uh, the main author of the report. Uh, just one, one very last thing. Uh, of course, there will be a Q&A &A session at the end, but please feel free to, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the Q&A at any time in the Q&A button at the bottom. So, because we will give priority to the first uh, submitted question. So uh, now I guess we can move into the real, um, the real, the real part of, of this webinar. So Ms. Melanie Lee, uh, she is a senior consultant at Bestow Consulting and also the main author uh, of, of this report. By the way, the report is available on the website of the USME Center and it can be downloaded free of charge, but, but you have to register on the website first. After registration, you can download it for free. Um, so Melanie is a senior consultant at Bestow Consulting. Uh, Bestow Consulting is a very nice firm that provides very um, specialized compliance 
solutions to global clients in China, especially in the industrial sector, I have to say. Uh, please, Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in, in any case, Melanie, before joining Bestow, uh, she, had, she had worked in one of the largest Chinese home appliance companies for 10 years. And uh, um, her, her, her main focus was uh, on automated production management and products quality control, and as well on procurement and implementation of autom automated production solutions. Um, so maybe Melanie, I, I will leave the floor to you now if you want to add some, some, something more about yourself, otherwise you can go straight uh, on the report. I will stop sharing my screen. Um, so now the floor is yours. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thank you, Alessio, and uh, hello, everyone. Good morning and good, yeah, good, sorry, good morning and good evening. And it's really a great pleasure to be invited by the EU SME Center and the CICC to present this report. Now I'll share the slides that uh, we're going to present to you. And uh, basically, uh, we'll present the general contents of the report to you in five sectors. Uh, first is market overview, and then key policies and regulations, market access requirements, opportunities and challenges, and then case study. And uh, the first, uh, sorry. Um, okay, now let's see the first slice, uh, market overview. China, as we all know, is a big market, but regarding on why we should say that for industrial robots and exactly how big the market is, let's see some numbers first. Uh, for eight consecutive years since 2013, China has been the world's largest market for industrial robots in many aspects. In terms of supply in 2020, the output of China's industrial robots are more than 230,000 units with a 19% 19% of increase and then from January to May 2021 the output achieved an increase of 73% over the same period of last year and on the demanding side the sales volume of industrial robots in the country was about 117,000 units in 2020 with an increase of 18% compared to the previous year obviously and these sales and the sales revenue reached 6.32 billion US dollars, quite a number. And now next, what makes China become such a big market? Speaking of that, three factors are actually believed to be the key for its fast development. The first is labor. China's aging population results in an increasing shortage of low-end labor and in rising labor costs, which in turn leads to a large number of manufacturers adopting industrial robots over manual labor. Secondly, China's efforts to upgrade its industrial structure and move up the value chain results in a demand for higher product quality, and it greatly pushes the industrial robot sector to grow. And another important factor driving the development of the sector it's strong policy support, and it's a quite big and key topic that we'd like to cover. So please allow me to say further explanation in the following chapter later. Next, we'll see our uh, regarding product product categories and application. Currently, in Chinese markets, industrial robots are mainly divided into four categories: articulated robots, collaborative robots, delta robots, and scar robots. They have been widely adopted in China and are covering dozens of processes in different manufacturing sectors. Among all these sectors, for application fields in 2020, the automotive, which was further divided into auto parts, vehicles, and automotive electronics, along with the 3C industries are the dominant ones. Seeing in the diagram in this slide, we, we can see that the number marked with a light bulb are the numbers for the automotive and 3C. So together, these two consist of more than half of the total applications of industrial robots in China in the year of 2020. However, the 3C and the automotive domination may change in the future because dri driving by the push of intelligent manufacturing, industry robots are increasingly being applied in a wide range of other industries, and especially in metal processing, chemical industry, rubber, plastics, and food processing. 
It is becoming a comprehensive matrix for combined analysis on both market application sectors and these four main types of robots, which can involve very specific data. I won't take much of your time at this section, and, but we managed to cover some different perspective in the full report, and please check them out if it is of interest to you. Next, in regards of the key regions and clusters, they are mainly concentrated in three regions in China. First, I see the biggest one, the Yangtze River Delta, along with the Pearl River Delta, these two represent the first and the second most developed robot industry clusters in China. The advantage of the Yangtze River Delta region lies in the development network of highways, railways, and ports, as well as high concentration of production factors and the investment flows. It's solid foundations for development for the manufacturing industry, along with a favorable policy support environment also helps a lot. The region is focusing in particular on engineering, machinery, aircraft, shipbuilding, automotives, 3C and biotechnologies. And big cities like Shanghai, Hangzhou are included in this region. And the next region we're going to introduce is the Pearl River Delta. The development of the industrial robots industry here builds upon the solid manufacturing basis that were established in the region since China's economic reforms in the late 90s, sorry, in the 1970s. In this region, you will too find a well-known cities called whereas Guangzhou and Shenzhen, as you probably all know that. And the region was established itself as a key labor-intensive industrial cluster for small-scale processing and light manufacturing. They focusing particularly on high-end equipment, household appliances, food packaging, 3C manufacturing, and ceramic production. The region has a great demand of industrial robots, and especially for numerical control equipment, Unmanned logistics, automatic controllers, and drones, etc. The third region that we're going to introduce is the Bohai Sea and Shandong region. It is actually the Beijing and Tianjin Hebei region, which, which would be extended to the entire Bohai Sea region, thus including Shandong province. The development of this region is characterized by regional collaboration and complementarity. Different cities or areas within the region would have their own specialized section within the industry, thus they forming a complementary effect. This region's development benefits from an increasing number of enterprises and startups of various types of robots. They all settling in the region and attracted by high quality talent resources and preferential policies. In addition, Innovative enterprises and research institutes in the region are strongly dedicated to the R&D of new generation information technologies, which is one of the key priority sectors of the local administrations. Now let's see them as a whole. By the end of 2020, the total number of robot enterprises in China has reached 11,066. We can see that three regions we just introduced have taking up the biggest proportion regarding the number of enterprises. Other cluster regions include Northeast region and the Chengdu and Chongqing region. They also host a significant number of robot enterprises and more than 60 robots industrial parks have been established across the country. And we believe the number will keep increasing in the future. Now let's take a look at the major players in the China market. Speaking of industrial robots, four important enterprises that are considered at the top level, which in some ways we call them as the big four. They are Fanac, ABB, KUKA, and Yaskawa. The, they are also the dominant players in China as well, and most of them enter the market in the 1990s. Under different business models, though, a uh, joint venture with local electric giants build their own factories or even set up global headquarters here in China. And all of them made quite remarkable market achievements so far, even during the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The major industrial robots manufacturers in the Chinese market still managed to achieve a solid growth in 2020, which is a good news. And the big four are the familiar and well-known faces for the industry, and uh, you can find more details on their practice and approaches in the report for their activities in China market. 
So what I'd like to introduce a bit more are three of the major local manufacturers called Aston, Searson, and Effort. Aston was founded in 1993 and the company officially listed in the Shenzhen Stock Exchange in 2015. They had a rich history of overseas mergers and acquisitions and investments. They focus on R&D and production of high-end intelligent mechanical equipment, along with its core control and functional components. The company is also very active in the formulation of national or sectoral standards related to industrial robots. The sales volume of Essence Industrial Robot also increased rapidly. The annual shipments in 2020 exceeded 5,000 units with an increased rate of more than 25% compared with the previous year. Sun is actually affiliated with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. It is present in several industrial parks in China and its main customers are found in automotive industry at the moment. According to its financial statement of 2020, the company achieved an operating revenue of 2.66 billion RMB, an unfortunate 3% decrease year to year, mostly due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. But new orders increased by the around 25% uh, over the same period. An effort was founded in 2007, and it is listed on the SciTech Innovation Board of the Shanghai Stock Exchange in 2020. Its business covers flexible wedding systems for the automotive industry, intelligent spraying systems, intelligent polishing and metal processing systems in general industries. Many of EFIS core technologies were obtained through mergers and acquisitions overseas, and it has established 19 subsidiaries around the world. So for a general review on the key players, this page will show a general idea on how these players of industrial robots perform in the Chinese market. From this diagram of market share in 2020, we can see top four are still the foreign invested manufacturers and the big four that we mentioned not only occupy a rather large market shares, but also performed better than the domestic competitors. As they focus more on high-end applications, this may be a signal that the demand for the high-end industrial robot products in the Chinese market was increased significantly and will keep doing so for the next couple of years. So after getting an idea on the market in this section, we'll walk you through the main policies and regulations of industrial robot sectors in China. Due to historic reasons and a unique governance system, China's industrial, deve industrial development is largely driven by the government policies. The situation is particularly prominent in those specific areas that are deemed as priority by the Chinese government, especially central ones. Such measures are generally called policy guidance, which generally means to put in a large amount of resources. This would be uh, specifically reflected in like um, government funded R&D and engineering products, subsidies, credit and preferential tax policies from governments at all levels. It's all aimed at accelerating the development of the industry and the industrial robots have long been one of the core sectors of China's development priorities. And a large number of policy documents and development plans have been issued to drive the development of this industry, both at the central and the local level. So on the state council level, two policies are extremely important to industrial robots. First, made in China 2025, it is a pragmatic prom strategic uh, policy and or document issued by the state council in 2015 to guide the development of the manufacturing industry over the next decade. A core element of the strategy is to promote the deep inter inter integration of informati informatization and industrialization, which paves the way for the introduction of new generation information and communication technologies, especially in the manufacturing industry. At the same time, high-end automated machine and robots were including among the 10 key focus sectors of the document. And within the specific fields of industrial robots, 
The MIC 2025 outlines the necessity to accelerate the development of intelligent manufacturing equipment and products. It also regards robots as one of the key areas in which technological and industrial breakthrough should be achieved. The next document is the 14th five-year plan. It is the top level policy document of the State Council for Economic and Social Development in the period of 2021 to 2025. And the 14th five-year plan proposes to accelerate the establish of a new development pattern with domestic grid circulation as the mainstay and domestic and international circulations reinforcing each other. So the plan requires Jake to take into account international economic and trade activities and promoting the external circulation of the economy. So strong support will be given to the foreign investors for establishing R&D centers in China, especially in high-end industries. In practice, this will translate into generate, uh, like general subsidies, tax incentives, and government grants, especially by local administrations, which are eager to attract high value investment in, within their jurisdictions. And I, we think that would obviously lead to a boost in the relevant market. And on the ministry level in China, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, MIIT, and the National Development and Reform Commission, NR, NDRC, are the most closely involved in the industrial robot in, in industry. And over the years, these two ministries have issued a large number of policy documents and plans for industrial robots. We summarized the significant ones released mainly in the past three years. And here we would briefly introduce three of them for reference. The first one is called Standard Conditions for the Industrial Robots Industry. It is a very practical document for the sector as it is the benchmark to determine whether the manufacturer are qualified to apply for incentives and preferential policies at the national level. The document puts forward a series of conditions that industrial robot enterprises must meet, and it means the failure to meet these conditions might hinder the eligibility or accessibility to such schemes, even if not specifically required. And the second one is called Catalog for guiding the restructuring of the industry. It aims to channel investment flows and government-funded projects in key strategic areas. Through the formulation and adoption of preferential fiscal tax, credit, land, import, and export policies. Relating to the industrial robots, the document encourages the, the development of a variety of products, models, and types. You may refer to the more details in the report. And the third one called, okay, let me take a breath. It's called Guiding Opinions on Expanding Investments in Strategic Emerging Industries and on Cultivating and Strengthening New Growth Points and Posts. It in general aims to guide the expansion of investment in strategic emerging industries and to cultivate and strengthen new drivers of economic growth. The document calls out for an accelerating and focusing the efforts to strengthen weak areas in the high-end equipment and manufacturing industry by supporting the production of advanced equipment such as industrial robots, special robots in construction, and healthcare services especially, and carry out pilot programs of intelligent manufacturing and intelligent construction. So speaking of government funding R&D projects and incentives, they are the common to adopted for implementing national policies. So a number of national key R&D programs, which we call NKPs, were issued by the Ministry of Science and Technology. In particular, the Intelligent Robots NKP was launched in 2017 to support RMB of cutting edge technologies in six directions until 2020. Other NKPs launched for the uh, 14th five year plan period also include topics related to the industrial robots and including the industrial software NKP and the smart sensors NKP are quite important. And major research plans are also a strong tool to boost sector development in China. 
National Natural Science Foundation of China has launched a major research plan on fundamental theories and key technologies of tricore robots. The plan will grant from 2017 to 2024 around 200 million RMB to support basic and applied research on fundamental theories and key technologies of tricore robot structure, perception and control, with particular focus on the demand for tricore robots in the field of intelligent manufacturing, medical rehabilitation, and nation defense. At the same time, Local administration at all levels in China, actually, starting from district high-tech zone level to a municipal and provincial level, they have all launched subsidies and funding schemes to support entities within their jurisdiction to conduct R&D on various priority sectors, and including industrial robots, obviously. And we have provided more specific de details of the regional policies and documents in the report I hope they will be helpful for the SMEs in the sector. And now let's move to the market access requirements. In order to be sold on the Chinese market, the industrial robot products must comply with the five mandatory national standards we listed in the slide. These standards are identical to ISO and IEC standards, meaning that European enterprises adopting this will not have major difficulty to be compliant in China. And next, the China Robot Certification, which we generally call CR certification, is actually a recommended certification scheme for robot products. They established this certification in 2016 by several relevant national ministries in China. One of the objectives of the scheme is to actively promote the use of certification resulting policies, such as special finance projects, financial credit, tax reduction and exemption and major products. Although the CR certification remains a voluntary scheme is not binding, it still presents an effective method to demonstrate safety and performance, as well as compliance with the above standards it is increasingly being used as a key eligibility requirement for apply to many certificate research projects, government procurement, and large end user projects. We, we will provide very thorough process on the access of the CR certification in the report. And the report also covers the certification rules respectively for all the other types of robots that the CR certification will cover and uh, you can find more details in the report. And finally, we must clarify that there might be additional mandatory requirements for special robots used in the specific industries or for specific purposes. So manufacturers are suggested to be aware of the compliance measures. And talking about process tariffs and costs for exporting to China, uh, in general, with a few exemptions, the Chinese customs do not have major restrictions or inspection and quarantine requirements for industrial robots. In the report, we summarize these requirements according to the HS codes used for the industrial robot products. And in general, different documents are required for different product categories. But the ones are mostly common scenes that are um, Let's see, uh, customs clearance of entry commodities, automatic import license, and China compulsory certification, which is known as the CCC. Despite all the requirements, uh, the goods are generally will be cleared within five to eight days if the rules are correctly followed, and detailed guidelines on China's custom clearance process have been produced by the EU SME Center, and you can turn to them for help anytime. For tariffs, European enterprises exporting industrial robots to China generally will need to pay a series of tariffs and taxes, like actually most of the importing goods, including import duties and value-added tax. So no consumption tax must be paid for the industrial robots, luckily, and uh, different types of industrial robots apply for different tax, rate, uh, tax rates, actually. So for cost, it's basically the routine and the regular costs that needed to be paid for import and export, so, such as like um, commonly like freight insurance, customer declaration, etc. 
So for requirements for investing in China, if you're interested, uh, the legal framework for the management and the supervision of foreign investments in China is constituted mainly by the foreign investment law, which came into force in January 2020. And the supporting documents of this law is called Regulations for the Implementation of the Foreign Investment Law. So on the basis of this legal framework, entry in the Chinese market is regulated by a series of additional regulations, most notably those called negative lists, in which stipulates open, restricted, or prohibited sectors for foreign investments. But luckily, industrial robots are included in none of the list that we mentioned above. This means that European investors will be treated on equal footing as domestic investors with no need for extra or pre-approval from authorities. As a matter of fact, industrial robots are positioned as encouraged industry for foreign investments and enterprises operating in industrial robots even can enjoy a series of preferential policies at the national level. Now let's move to the part of opportunities and the challenges. So Chinese market for industrial robots presents significant opportunities for European SMEs actually. A key factor is the strong support given to the sector by the Chinese government at both central and local level as we just explained. This has resulted in a wide range of preferential policies and incentives and in a large and constantly growing demand for industrial robots not only in traditional manufacturing sectors such as automotive and 3C industries, but also in new application fields such as environmental protection, food and beverage, healthcare, special operations, and the service industry. At the same time, however, strong government support has also led to an increasing number of Chinese domestic enterprises getting involved in the industrial robot sector through R&D activities or mergers and acquisitions it is very likely that domestic enterprises could receive like more favorable treatments comparing to those that foreign investors ones will receive when applying to government funded projects or procurement. But at least for the time being at the moment, I mean, domestic enterprises still have lower competitiveness and do not match the quality of foreign producers. And finally, although significant improvements have taken place in recent years, the Chinese institutional framework for intellectual property protection and enforcement remains not optimal and uh, in some ways not fully transparent. So these combined to the unpredictability of the new policies and regulations, it will bring significant uncertainties and risks to the European SMEs, particularly those with subsidies in China. So now we will move to the case studies. We actually interviewed three European industrial robots manufacturers operating in Chinese market. And the first case is, is an Italian global enterprise who entered in China in 1994. Their main products in China are six joint robots and collaborative robots. So the company has significantly benefited from the strong support obtained from the local administration in Shanghai. This came in various forms, and especially through a constant communication channel with the authorities. It aims at explaining current or forthcoming policies and addressing development issues occasionally encountered by the company. And the company maintains regularly, reg, uh, very regular communication with the Chinese government so far. They suffered from the skyrocketing international shipping costs during COVID-19 but they believe that now it is still a suitable time for European industrial robots SMEs to enter the market. The growing demand for industrial robots resulting in from the Chinese massive efforts to upgrade and automate its in industry, obviously, and it offers rising business opportunities in the Yangtze River Delta. Meanwhile, local business environments present significant advantages in terms of access to credit direct communication with the local authorities, supply chain maturity and transportation and logistics. Now the Italian company was quite an early player for China market in regards of the industrial robot sector and other ones got in later. 
and they actually encountered more difficulties in the beginning. So the next studies are about a leading SME from Finland and a sector leader from Germany. They both entered China in the 2000s, in the 2000s, actually the new century. The Finnish company is a small and a medium sized blast cleaning robot manufacturer. And the German enterprise is a leader in the field of industrial robots. Although they are of different products categories, both companies suffered a bit cultural shock in the preliminary days. In the market perspective, and also in the internal operation as well. The issues included a prolonged after sales response with their customer service department actually working in Europe and incompatible, uh, incompatible product line for the local market, higher costs in R&D and supply chain, et cetera. But they also managed to conquer the problem and achieve the rather good business in China after taking effective measures. The first one is to overcome cultural difference, obviously, by hire, they hiring more local staff who are familiar with local market drill and operation. They move part of R&D and build local technical teams for faster response. And other measures they have taken, like uh, changing production model to make use of local supply chain that will reduce cost, and then also introducing local investments. This means to attract a local shareholder or even get acquired by local giants. So to summarize the case studies, all enterprises mention one word, localization, which means suitable proportion of local marketing and technical employees and be aware and understand the culture and market difference. So find and choose region with industrial cluster and supporting policies are also important. Last but not least, what's more, Entering the market with clear target customers and prepared approaches. Unless the products you have are original, irreplaceable, or present high-end distinctive features, entering the Chinese market without clear customers will be very hard, as the competition is quite fierce. And in addition, European SMEs would get well prepared in this in advance. So I hope we have been able to give you a general idea on the situation of China's industrial robot market. And I'm taking the opportunity to briefly introduce a bit on our company. We, we are Bestel Consulting Company Limited. And uh, we are a China-based business and technology consultancy with a focus on regulatory compliance and government affairs. We help our global clients to better understand the complex and challenges of regulatory environments and market access requirements across many sectors in China. And our team is composed of highly specialized and experienced senior staff providing consultancy services in the area of standardization, regulatory compliance, conformity assessments, and market access. We also offer a set of tailor-made services according to our client's needs. A strong pillar of our service is what we call a um, alert system. It is a monthly observation on the new situation of the Chinese policies and the regulatory system for a particular industry by summarizing the policies and regulations published lately. And you can see our headquarters in, in Beijing and we have offices in Vancouver and Melbourne. You can see the contact info here. Our website and social media is always keep updating the regulatory news of the sectors we mainly cover. So welcome to check out what's happening in China through our channels. Finally, last but not the least, thank you everyone for joining my presentation of the report and thank you EU SME Center and the CICC for inviting me here. That would be all for my sharing today and I'm ready for the questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, for the for the great introduction. And before before moving to the questions, I would like to remind everybody: I have just shared a link to access the report uh, in the in the chat of the of the event. Uh, so you can click on the link and then you can access the report. But uh, if you haven't registered to the USME Center website, you have to do it first. Otherwise, uh, you will not be able to see the download uh, button. Um, so yeah, uh, moving into the questions, I, I have a uh, couple of questions myself. You mentioned among the challenges, the I, IP rights, the intellectual property rights, uh, that is uh, definitely a challenge. Uh, can, you, can you be, maybe, can you provide a couple more examples? Can you specify what risk would a foreign company and in particular SMEs encounter in China?
uh sorry uh i was dropped the the signal was not stable alessio right. would you please repeat don't the worry question? of course sorry. Sure, Sorry. sure. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, among the challenges you mentioned intellectual property rights. So uh, my question is, can you provide maybe more examples? Can you specify what, what specific risks uh, would a foreign company and in particular SMEs encounter in China? Okay, so uh, speaking of that, I would say uh, one of the topics that's probably many uh, foreign investors or foreign companies that would have concerns is the IPR, is the intellectual property rights. So uh, one obvious problem that uh, they are having in China is, you know, um, according to uh, some newly released documents and regulations, uh, if a foreign company who is invested in China, who has like a branch or a factory in China and they have new IPRs, and they want to share it or, you know, like transfer it into the headquarter back in Europe, that would be more difficult today based on the newly uh, released regulations because uh, now the governments from different levels required a review on this kind of, um, actually IPR is basically related to technologies, on, on the technologies. And there is a catalog uh, issued by the uh, Ministry of Commerce along with the Ministry of Science and Technologies. They uh, actually provide a list of technologies uh, in, in different sectors to say that uh, all the technologies or, you know, like IPR related things forced into the category or into the scope would need a review or like assessment before this technologies can actually transfer out of China and some of them are even prohibited. So I think that might be a potential concern for the, you know, the companies who are trying to have the R&Ds or, or, you know, technology advancement or updates in China. But right. um, there is a, you know, the update in news is that um, in September this year, earlier, like, two months ago, uh, two or three months ago. China actually released a national level document. It's called, uh, it, it's again with a long title, but in generally it says, uh, it's, it's like something like guidelines on building a powerful country with intellectual property rights. So China is taking measures and is, uh, you know, doing things to to improve its IPR rights protection. And you know, I think they, they, it might be, you know, each mirror has two sides. It might be a, a thing that, with pros and cons. The pros is that I think companies, whatever, regardless of domestic or international, you will have better IPR environment in China. That's for sure. But on the other side. Uh, would it be more difficult to to have the technologies which are quite like let's say um sensitive to move abroad if it's initiated in China? We don't know. We we will see further implement implementation measures or, or explanation documents in the late in the future. Hmm. But that I think would be a big topic. Right. So I think I think this is very much in line with uh, the general trend that we are seeing pretty much in, in all sectors. I mean, also this data protection law, personal information protection law, everything. Uh, many companies, what they are doing is there are things in China for China rather than, uh, you know, in China for the rest of the world. So there is this kind of localization trend uh, that uh, companies are following. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, maybe maybe uh, another question before we have two questions also in the in the chat. Um, sure. But before moving to them, I also received another question privately. Um, so we mentioned a lot of subsidies, a lot of incentives that you can get uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you invest in this sector, of course, in all priority sectors. Um, sure. So what are the requirements? Uh, and especially can foreign companies also access these subsidies? This, or is that something for local um, mm. companies? Actually, yeah, actually, that's a good question. Uh, that's very practical. And uh, actually, the first thing you need to do uh, in order to participate or have the qualification to join the incentives or the subsidies is you must have a registered unit in China, whether it's a branch or an office or a factory, they, they, they all work, but you have to have a business entity registered in China. That's the bottom line. 
And uh, um, I think uh, what we would suggest for the SMEs especially is to, because in China, like we just explained in the slides on national level and on the regional level, they all have different subsidies and incentives, which can be quite fruitful in, in some ways. Uh, if you find the, how to say, um, suitable combination or the su suitable registered location. So we would suggest the SMEs before entering China, if you haven't got into the market already, um, to do a good research on the latest policy or, or the incentive schemes on different levels, um, probably especially in the cluster regions that we just introduced because they, they are the ones more, more focused on the uh, industrial. And then uh, another suggestion that we would give is that um, mm, to find a reliable partner or a third party to help with a market survey or, or getting to know the market. Would, that will be more efficient and save a lot of time for, for the SMEs. Very good. Thank you, Manani. And by the way, speaking of incentives, we, we have also completed another report recently, which is exactly on this topic. So tries to map um, and group all these kind of incentives because incentives means many things. It can, there can be many types of incentives and subsidies. And yes. this report tries to uh, group them, summarize them. You can find it on our website. So uh, I will now move into the questions we have received from the, in the chat. <clears throat> The first, sorry, mm -hmm. the first one, um, China is very far and big. How does it work? The support, the support for an SME to step in the Chinese market, location, office, service, and so on. I think this question can be divided into two parts. Uh, the first part, maybe I would answer. Um, of course, uh, there are organizations like us, like the USME Center, but also yes. like the Italian Chamber or, or Chambers of Commerce of other countries um, that uh, provide this kind of support that could try to help you uh, identify a location or provide you a list of service providers that could, that could assist you. Um, some, co some countries also have programs that uh, basically provide you some financial support to, to land here in China. Um, so maybe my my advice is to, of course, you can reach out to us at USME Center. We, we, we provide the service for free not because we are funded by the, by the EU, but you can also try sure. to contact your national representations in China. They may be able to have. The second part, I think it also relates to maybe subsidies. And I think we talked about in, Melanie's, in the report, in Melanie's presentation, that this is a priority sector in China. And if it's a priority sector, you will for sure find a lot of support from local administration. You will find a lot of uh, local administrations very eager to, 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 to attract you into their areas and to offer you maybe some incentives, some policies. I don't know if you want to add something on this, Melanie. On uh, this. I, I think, I, I think Alessio covered all. The, the first, the, there are actually two general suggestions we would give. Uh, first, is do the market survey right with the right partner, like, you know, like USME Center and all the chambers, you know, like the commerce chambers that we have. And uh, second is to, uh, we would, again, uh, recommend to, to, to have, uh, whether it's third party or it's uh, to do it on your own, to go through Chinese latest uh, policies on the, you know, uh, supporting policies as well as the incentives, because, you may save a lot of time and uh, foundings and as well as uh, you know um, and uh, uh, resources to get a perfect location and uh, to to or to you know to get closer to the customer that you may have in the future. So that depends on different uh, you know specific products that you have. So um, right. yeah, that would be my two suggestions. Thank you, and and especially because here things in China change very rapidly, much more, <laughs> more more rapidly than than many other countries in the in the world, including the EU. Um, so moving to the second question, um, does the report include robots used as concierge for hotels, restaurants, and others? I think there was an, one slide at the beginning showing the different sectors in which uh, robots are applied, but maybe yeah. you. You can provide more. We can either go back to the slide or you can just provide more uh, information. Okay, I can share the slides, but basically, mm -hmm. um, I, I unfortunately I would say uh, we we didn't cover 
even if we cover it, we cover very few on um, these sectors because uh, such robots like concierge for the hotels, restaurants, uh, they are basically like service robots. And what we mainly cover in the report are the industrial robots. That's actually uh, different categories in China. But also the service robots are, are also one of the key sectors that because it's related to intellect, inter, uh, intelligent manufacturing as well, and the labor problem that we just explained. So that is also a very promising sector in China as well. But unfortunately, again, uh, we didn't cover much of that in the, in, uh, in the report. Uh, what we mentioned about food and beverage reports in the China and as well as in my presentation is basically for the uh, mass production. The, the you know the the yeah the, in in the workshops and uh, stuff like that the, the the big ones or the very uh precise ones not you know the ones that the end users or Service. you know yeah. we, we will encounter in yeah in the daily life uh, i hope that clarifies that question uh to me it does uh maybe if, if for the for the for the person it doesn't maybe i would invite um to to uh, elaborate a little bit more, but I also remember if I can add something. I also remember in the report. Uh, of course, there are the the two main application sectors are automotive, of course, and the three C consumer uh, yeah. consumer electronics. But I think uh, it also mentions that there are many new sectors emerging, like and I think food and beverage was one of these. Yeah. Of course, still in the industrial aspect, but but this is to sure. say that um, you know there are um, things are are becoming very variegated and and diversify so um i think the bottom line is that this is a robots in general or technology aspect yeah. technology sector which uh, chinese government really uh looks uh, is eager to to attract so you will be sure that you will find a lot of opportunities in this area uh yeah. maybe a couple of minutes maybe one very very last question before before we sure. end this this uh this webinar uh you mentioned um there could be uh, some additional mandatory requirements uh, for for mm -hmm. certain types of robots for special robots. W what is this? What what are you referring to? Uh, that's I I think that's uh, that's easier to explain. Let me just give some examples. First one is uh, industrial robots, like we explained, they generally doesn't doesn't need much, you know, like mandatory uh, standards besides the five ones that uh, we mentioned. But uh, in certain sectors. For example, like if we use, uh, if the industrial robots are selling to, to use for firefighting, there is a specific standard because this is a very specific uh, or in a very special sector. So they have their uh, special requirements and standards that uh, are binding or mandatory to be followed for all the equipments that are used for firefighting. That is an another. I think uh, very typical ones that uh, we would uh, introduce that's easier to understand is that if the industrial robot has a gasoline or diesel engine, it means that it will have some carbon emission. And then you have to follow the rules in China for the non-road machinery uh, emission requirements. So that's it because it's a combination of something more than pure industrial robots. So it's my be required to follow other mandatory requirements. So uh, such things. So uh, that's why we, uh, because sometimes the national procurement would involve such sectors. That's why mm. we suggested earlier that if we are selling the, the products to, to especially like big customers or national customers, that it's better that we, you know, look into the compliance problems in order to avoid, you know, potential risks. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie. It was very, very clear. And maybe, maybe now uh, I think uh, it's time, but we would really appreciate if you could take uh, one minute of your time to scan this QR code and, and, and give us uh, your feedback. Of course, we have to organize uh, many of the events, so we would appreciate input on potential topics or sectors that you would like us to cover. Um, of course, I mean, what we covered today was just a very short uh, overview of this report. This report is much more detailed and we really invite you to, to download it. And, and you will see it's really, really detailed and comprehensive and up to date. So uh, at the same time, if there is any questions in the next days, uh, we at the SME, US SME Center are here. We can also uh, reach out to Melanie or the Italian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are here to assist you and, and please uh, don't hesitate to 
uh, get in touch with us. So um, I would end it here. I thank you all for, for, for participating, listening to this webinar. Thank you, Melanie, for this excellent thank presentation you. and for the excellent work in doing the report. Thanks to CICC who uh, supported, uh, coordinated the, the work of the report um, together with us. So thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Okay, see you, bye-bye, <laughs> thank you. Bye.